In this review of Labyrinth of Galleria the Moon Society, I'll tell you all about its unique dungeon crawling mechanics, why it surprised me so much, and why you might want to consider it even if you're not a big dungeon crawler fan. Now as far as the story goes, it follows a character named Eureka, a young girl who comes to Galleria Manor in search of work. Little does she know what she's in for. Now early on she befriends a spirit named Fanti, technically that's the character you play as, but we'll get to that. Now this manor is owned by a character known as the Count, and he wants priceless art called Curios found and retrieved within the labyrinth under the manor. Now that's just the broad strokes of the game, and I appreciate the lengths the team went to making the story interesting. For one, it has great art. The characters animate in these visual novel style segments, and it's fully voiced in English. That all said, I just didn't really care for the story. The characters weren't particularly strong or compelling. In fact, after about 5 or 10 hours, I just started skipping most of the dialogue because I just wanted to get back to the dungeon crawling because it was so good. Now if you're like me and you decide to just sort of skip through the story, the game does provide a general objective back at your home base menu in case you just want to play the game. Now you may end up finding it more interesting than I did, but for me, I'm just here for the gameplay, and so let's get into that next. Now, as you might have been able to tell, Labyrinth of Galleria is a first-person dungeon crawler. It'll explore parts of the dungeon, find treasures to either sell or equip on your characters, fight enemies in turn-based combat, and rinse and repeat for about 40 plus hours. Now, on paper, I know that can sound kind of boring, but Labyrinth of Galleria does a lot of cool things that will keep you hooked first to start with the way you actually explore the dungeon. Now when you start you'll just be walking around opening doors and finding switches to unlock locked doors. However very early on you'll get the ability to break through walls. Now disclaimer I've only played a few Etrian Odyssey games and that's really it as far as dungeon crawlers go. I'm not super familiar with the genre and so I don't know if this is a common mechanic but it is a really fun one. To me it just totally blows open how you explore in this game. Just when you think you're stuck or you're at a dead end and you don't know where to go then boom you just break through a wall and you can find a secret or a new path. And what's nice is on the map, the bright yellow walls you can't break through and the darker ones you can. Now you can't break walls infinitely. You have something called reinforce points and these can be refilled by finding mana points. That said, you can't just break through every wall. You'll have to pick and choose and be a little bit careful. Now with rare exception, most of the walls get rebuilt once you return to the surface and come back down. However, there are some that stay open. Now as the game progresses, you'll unlock new exploration abilities. Things like jumping over big gaps, exploring ooze-filled caverns, and breathing underwater. Now the labyrinth itself has several subsections, and these new abilities will open up older sections, and so you'll end up backtracking and going back through lots of the dungeon that you had done already. Now admittedly, this can get frustrating. There were several times where I was super lost and I had to consult guides from people that played the Japanese version. I found myself jumping down pits, taking big damage. This was just not a good idea. And in fact, I ended up getting more confused. As far as I can tell, there's always a way to progress naturally with the abilities you've been given, so don't forget to use them and you should find the exit. Now, all of this is to say that I loved exploring in this game. Now, whether it was my OCD wanting to fill every single inch of this map or whatever it may have been, it was just super satisfying to find everything and then go to the stairs and get to the next layer of the labyrinth. Next, let's talk about the combat. Again, it looks fairly basic. It's just turn-based combat where you pick abilities and you hit your enemies. Pretty standard for dungeon crawlers. Now, at the beginning of the game, you get something called paper dolls and you use these to create your characters. These are everything from name, class, colors, their favorite food, lucky number, and much more. I'm not sure what some of the more ancillary things do, but it was interesting to do nonetheless. Now, of course, because this is a Nippon Ichi game, there's always a weird twist to kind of take this to 11. For one, you have five positions where you can place characters, and you think, okay, well, you can only have five characters max. Oh no, you can have way more than that. Now, each position is filled with a pact, essentially a group of characters that each gets certain abilities. Now, each pact gets different bonuses. Some may be extra HP or do more damage. And at the beginning, you can only have one character per pact, but as the game goes on, you'll unlock bigger ones, and you can end up having eight characters in a pact. Now, personally, I never did that. I kind of just kept it to about three or four at a time, but it was really neat to have just this giant party rocking around the dungeon. Now, the other thing that gives it some depth is formations. Essentially, each pact of characters can be either the vanguard in the front row or in the rear guard. Now, depending on where people are positioned, you'll get different formations that give you different bonuses. For example, if everyone's in the rear guard, it's much easier to run away. And if everyone's in the vanguard, then you can do way more damage. It was fun unlocking these, testing these out, and just coming up with different cool combinations. 
Now, the game also has a risk reward mechanic when it comes to storing up XP. So you can spend one of your reinforced points to bank your XP. And if you do this, you'll get progressively higher experience each time. It builds a bonus each time. And so the longer you do it, the more XP you'll get. However, if you die or exit the dungeon before banking them by just defeating an enemy normally, you'll lose all of it. And I gotta say, this happened a lot with me. So it's a really fun mechanic to kind of introduce some risks to the game. And it's also really good for leveling up low level characters. Now you can also level up your characters through a couple different ways like eating meat that the monsters drop or just returning to the surface before you die and you'll get some bonus XP. Now the game also has some alchemy mechanics. Essentially you can take existing gear, synthesize it with other existing gear and make it stronger. You can also disassemble items for mana and you'll use mana to spend on witch petitions. Now these witch petitions unlock extra abilities like healing you a certain percentage after battle, showing treasure chest items on a particular part of the dungeon or increasing the potency of exploration abilities like lasting longer underwater. This was such a great hook to keep me exploring for that next unlock. And overall, I think this is the game's greatest strength. There are so many hooks and so many different treadmills to keep you playing. Whether you just want to level up a character, unlock the next witch petition, or just get to the end of a particular subsection of the dungeon. There are so many times I looked at the clock while I was playing this game and it was past 1am and I just had to turn my switch off and go to bed. And by the way, the switch or a steam deck is definitely the ideal way to play this game. Now I say this game surprised me because I didn't expect it to hook me this badly. I thought I'd enjoy it, sure, because I liked Etrian Odyssey, but not like this. So if you like dungeon crawlers, you're probably gonna dig this game. Now from a presentational standpoint, the art style is pretty strong. Obviously it's the same artist from the Disgaea series. It's really striking and super colorful. Now admittedly, most of the art is 2D outside of the dungeon environments. It won't blow you away by any means, but it looks pretty good. All the different character and monster designs are pretty strong. The one thing I didn't like was that on rare occasions it got a little overly sexual. For example, some of the base character designs look a little too exposed and they even look underage, which is kind of weird. And there's even this one story segment where a character takes her shirt off and the only thing covering her boobs is her hair. It seemed totally unnecessary and out of place and just made me feel awkward. For the music, it's just okay. If you're familiar with Disgaea games, it's from the same composer and it kind of has that weird distinctive sound to it. I personally don't care for it at all. And in fact, I mostly played this game without sound, listening to podcasts or other YouTube videos. Now going into Labyrinth of Galleria, I had low expectations. However, I came out pleasantly surprised. The game has a really strong art style and addictive game loop. It kept me hooked unlocking the next ability and exploring to the next layer of the dungeon. For anyone that's a dungeon crawler fan, this is an absolute must play. And if you're not, maybe you've played like a Persona game or something like that, I would even consider giving this a try because you might really enjoy it. Now, if you want to see what other JRPGs are still to come for 2023, make sure you watch this video right here. And special thanks to Reset Switch, Tyler Kuzava, and the Miyazaki Man for supporting me over on Patreon. To get exclusive videos and other cool perks, consider supporting me over on patreon.com slash thegamingshelf. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.